In this lecture, we talk about development of the nervous system. We'll start with neuralation. Then we'll cover how neurons are born and generally migrate to the area that they're going to live in. Uh, finally, we'll talk about how synapses form. So we'll cover a bit of axon guidance uh, and touch a bit on formation of synapses in the central and peripheral nervous systems. And from this, we'll, we'll kind of see why it is that we have uh, topographic mapping kind of across all structures of the nervous system, uh, whether it be sensory or, or motor structures. There's a map somewhere. So we'll begin with neurulation. And neurulation is, is the process where we take the nervous tissue and separate it from the rest of the ectoderm. Uh, the rest of that ectoderm will go on to form the epidermis. Following neurulation, several rounds of cell division are going to then create our, our young, developing nervous system. <clears throat> so we all start off life as a sheet. And we're a sheet with about three layers or so. Uh, the outermost layer is the ectoderm. And this will form the, the skin and, and, more importantly, the nervous tissue. Uh, underlying that, we have the mesoderm. And of course, these aren't just lines, there's bumps, swellings within these layers. And then on the inside, we have the endoderm. So within, this is going to form our viscera. The meso will form our musculoskeletal system. And the ectoderm forms the outside and also the nervous tissue. So we have to take that outside and pull it inward. I don't know about you, but my nervous tissue is certainly under the skin. So, we're going to go from a sheet to a sheet with a tube in it. So we got our ectoderm here. It's going to fold over right there in the center. And the reason it folds over in the center is because a portion of the mesoderm called the notochord The notochord is going to act as an organizer for the rest of the body. So this is found in the midline of the mesoderm. I'm not going to draw the rest of the structures because they don't matter. But that notochord is actually attached to the ectoderm, so it sort of forms a hinge point right here, so that as cell division goes on and our ectoderm expands and cell migration occurs, some movement toward the middle, we fold over right here at the midline and we form then this neural groove. So the neural plate is kind of a flat structure. As it grows, that plate forms a groove. And up here, we have our neural folds. There's our neural folds. This is now the neural groove. And then we have the rest of the ectoderm. This will be skin. These neural folds are going to touch and then eventually separate, giving us the neural tube. This will be the epidermis. It's not right now, but I'm going to call it that. We're going to predict the future here. And that's our notochord. This will continue to organize structures, as we'll see, and it'll eventually form the centrum of uh, the spine. Now, the way that the notochord acts as an organizer for the rest of the tissue is by spitting out little diffusible factors, little proteins. And if you're close to it, then you get a much higher dose, and that changes your fate. It changes which transcription factors you express, and thus what cell fate you adopt. So those that are near the midline become nerve cells. 
those that are further out don't get the same exposure to these uh, BMP inhibitors, just these little diffusible proteins. So they have a different cell fate as a result. Just that simple. The nodal cord continues to spit out stuff here to affect gene expression even after neurulation. After we form the neural tube, the more ventral parts that are closer to the nodal cord are going to have a different fate than those in the more dorsal part. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Now, this separation isn't clean. When the neural tube separates from the rest of the ectoderm, some of the future neural cells break off. And this would be your neural crest. These then migrate, some of them anyway. Some will stay local. So here's a somite. This is a part of the mesoderm that will form your musculoskeletal system for each kind of division from top to bottom of the body. So some of the neural crest is going to invade the somite and go live there. Right? Those might become postganglionic parasympathetic neurons. Maybe they help form the uh, enteric nervous system, so maybe they migrate and start to live with, in some of the endoderm. Others stay local, and they're going to form the dorsal root ganglion, for example. So those that stay local and divide up, they'll eventually project back and create the dorsal root or the spinal cord. Anything that's derived from the neural crest, that's going to live outside the central nervous system. So all the peripheral neurons are derived from the neural crest. Now there is some aspect of the peripheral nervous system that's created here in the neural tube because we will eventually form motor neurons and they'll project outward to innervate those somites as well. So as you can see in this cartoon illustration here, we start off as a flat plate. This folds over on itself through the process of neurulation and now we have a neural tube. This is facilitated, of course, by the notochord that acts as a hinge and a guide. Here we'll see an animation of neurulation. So we start off as a disc. Here we can see the neural groove forming. When it first start, starts off, they call it that primitive streak there and then rounds of cell division kind of thicken up the neural plate causing that expansion and the formation of these neural folds inside of which we have our neural groove. Now the neural folds begin to touch one another and zipper up around the region of our neck and then they'll continue rostrally and caudally to zipper up and form our head and then tail, which we all have and eventually lose before we're born. All the somites, uh, or the, the mesodermal structures that flank each section of our uh, neural tube here, are going to go and form the musculoskeletal components of the body, and they're, they'll serve as a guide for those neural crest cells that innervate them. And when we're done with neurulation, we have a brain and a spinal cord. Now the brain doesn't look like much of a brain. It starts off with only three swellings. There's the prosencephalon, the forebrain, the mesencephalon, which is just a little lower, the midbrain, and then there's the rhombencephalon, the hindbrain. So just three little swellings you can see there on the left. As we continue through development, we're going to see expansion of the first and third sections. So the prosencephalon will split into two and form the telencephalon, that's the cerebrum, kind of where the magic happens, and the diencephalon, or the thalamus, the thalamic structures there. Very important relays. The midbrain, although it doesn't split into two, it bends about 90 degrees, and that's why we have to switch dorsal from this direction in the spinal cord to this direction when you're in the forebrain, because of that bend in the midbrain. So the mesencephalon will bend. The rhombencephalon divides into two. It forms the metencephalon, which will form the pons and cerebellum, and the myelencephalon, 
which forms the medulla. So we have three swellings, turns into five. Of course, these structures uh, then have rounds of cell division, become larger, and they'll develop distinct nuclei within them. The rounds of cell division that go on are carried out by neural progenitor cells. Those are cells that are the progenitors to neurons, as well as other types of nerve cells. The cell bodies of these neural progenitor cells are found in a region called the ventricular zone. That means it's right around the ventricles. So if you have a look here, there's a few examples of ventricular zones. Whether you're in the spinal cord, in panel A there, that central canal, that's a ventricle. Or if you're in the cortex, the lateral ventricles, surrounding the lateral ventricles, that has a ventricular zone as well. So regardless of where you are, there's probably a ventricle near you, some source of fluid, and that's where the progenitor cells are found, at least their cell bodies. Now these progenitor cells, in most areas, span from bottom to top and create a essentially a road for newborn neurons to crawl on. So if we consider our cortex, they'll extend a fiber called the radial glial fiber from bottom to top. So here's my ventricle. Let's say it's a lateral ventricle and we're up in the cerebral cortex. And this is the surface. This is where the papilla will be someday. Now we're going to expand this cortex and create layers. But first we have to go through a few rounds of cell division. So here's our radial glial cell right there. And there will be a few of these. But they radiate from the ventricle to the top. So from the basal to the apical surface there. The radial glia undergo two different types of cell division. Now early on, we go through symmetric cell division, where we just clone ourselves. In symmetric cell division, one neural progenitor cell creates two neural progenitor cells. So the two daughter cells are clones of the mother. They're exactly the same. Nothing has changed. And that's because they've equally distributed the transcription factors that determine cell fate. If these are evenly distributed, when we divide in half, we create two cells with the same fate. That is, neural progenitor cells. Later in development, though, external cues actually help the cell pull the transcription factors to one side. Of course, there's different transcription factors that get put on the other side, but we'll forget about those for now. So now when we divide in half, we create two different types of cells. One of them will remain a neural progenitor cell because it has those transcription factors. That's the little purple dots. The other one doesn't get them. So it's going to adopt a very different cell fate. So this will stay a neural progenitor cell. This will become a neuron. It's going to exit the cell cycle and form a newborn neuron. So in symmetric cell division, we get two clones. In asymmetric cell division, we create two different types of cells. So the amount of symmetric cell division kind of determines the, the number of neurons, kind of the uh, the size of the nervous system, the actual neurons that were made through asymmetric cell division. So when a newborn neuron splits off from our radial glial cell here, it then migrates on up the radial glial fiber and settles near the surface. And there it'll differentiate, form some dendrites, And if neurons are born around the same time, they're going to settle around the same area and adopt a similar fate. And that's why we're going to have distinct layers in the cortex. This will come up later in the class. Now let's imagine that we go down in time a little bit and our cortex is starting to expand because of several rounds of cell division taking place.
Well, now the newborn neuron is going to crawl a little further because the radial glial fibers extending up a little further. So this is just a division of time. This is early and this is later. Well, because it's later, we're going to give that newborn neuron a different set of transcription factors. I'll just go ahead and give it some. Give it some brown ones. That's why it's brown up here. So that neuron is going to crawl on up. It's going to hit a different layer and it's going to form a different type of neuron. Maybe now it's going to be stellate instead of pyramidal. We'll still have a nice layer right here. Right? That won't be gone, it's just they won't be newborn. These will be older, well-established, senior neurons at this point. And so we'll go and settle on this surface layer to create a new layer of cortex. Kind of nice. So here's a radial wheel uh, fiber with a newborn neuron crawling on it. So it's crawling along in a dish. And this is what happens in, in real life. Those newborn neurons come off here in the ventricular zone, and then they crawl on up. They have to come from the cell body, of course. Right? They need a nucleus. So they're formed here, and they crawl up the fiber and settle at the top. And so we create layer upon layer of neurons, at least excitatory neurons. The inhibitory neurons have to migrate from further away. They'll migrate from a place called the ganglionic eminences. This is still a ventricular zone, it's just a little more ventral. So if we were to draw this on down, maybe get this crap out of the way. Inhibitory neurons are going to form from precursor neuroprogenitor cells here as well, again through asymmetric cell division. But rather than crawling along a radial glial fiber, these newborn neurons are going to crawl their way into the cortex. Or they might settle somewhere else, like the striatum, for example. So when we talk about the basal ganglia, you're going to notice there's an awful lot of GABAergic neurons there. There's a lot of inhibitory neurons. And the reason for that is because they come from the ganglionic eminences. And the types of neurons that we make here are inhibitory. And that's why later on in lecture 20, maybe 21, could be 19, I forget. When we talk about the basal ganglia, though, we're going to see a lot of inhibitory neurons because they're subcortical structures. They're not up in the cortex, which is where we make a lot of excitatory neurons. They're derived from the ganglionic eminences, which make inhibitory neurons. Some will form the basal ganglia, others will go into the cortex and form the inhibitory neurons there. So putting the brain together is going to require uh, some cell division, but also some cell migration, because not everything is born locally. This is a little different than the spinal cord, uh, where things are going to be born locally. There's not nearly as much logic in the spinal cord as there is in the cortex. There's some logic there, and we'll talk about that, but for the most part, the spinal cord is a relay. So the development of the spinal cord uh, is going to involve determining what's up what's down, so what's dorsal, what's ventral, and then adopting the sensory and motor function accordingly. Then, of course, we'll need to surround ourselves with some bone, and we'll cover that right at the end. So, back to our developing neural tube. Now, the spinal cord remains as a tube. It's kind of convenient, I suppose. But through rounds of cell division, our neural tube is going to expand. So this is the neural tube. This will form the brain. It'll also, in this case, form the spinal cord. That's what we're going to look at here. Now, how do we know where we're at? How do we know if I'm in the ventral portion or the dorsal portion? It all depends on how close I am to the notochord. Again, we're spitting out diffusible factors here. In this case, sonic hedgehog. This is one of the hedgehog signaling proteins here. This is going to be present at very high levels in the ventral portion, and that causes neurons to adopt a motor neuron phenotype. 
So if you have a high level of sonic hedgehog signaling, that'll um, cause the expression of PAC6, and that's a transcription factor that'll turn us into motor neurons. If you're going to be a sensory neuron, you're not going to get a high level of sonic hedgehog signaling. Right? Neither from the notochord or some... There's also organizer tissues here in the floor plate. We'll give them a pie wedge, why not? Now, if you're in the dorsal portion, you're going to get a different set of organizers here. Bone morphogenic proteins, or BMP. Wnt signaling is uh, also important. We're going to spit out diffusible proteins. And let's not forget, of course, our neural crest cells over here. These are, of course, at least those in the dorsal part here, going to have a sensory phenotype. They're going to form primary somatosensory neurons. And the reason that they'll do, at, do that is because of the high concentration of, in this case, WENT, WENT is pretty important, and BMPs. So, diffusible factors, in other words. I don't expect you to know what they are, but there are proteins that are spat out, and that affects which transcription factors we have present. Depending on which transcription factors you have, that determines what genes you express, and thus what fate you have. What type of cell are you? So those in the dorsal portion here, uh, for example, in the dorsal root ganglion, uh, snail 2, which is a transcription factor turned on by Wnt. It's kind of a strange name, but that is what it is. That will cause the formation of a somatosensory neuron. So they'll eventually send their axons back in to make those dorsal roots. The ventral roots will be created by the axons leaving from motor neurons. But whether you become sensory or motor depends on what type of proteins are you exposed to. Where do you live? That's going to determine then where your axon goes as well, because those are going to guide axons. So they, they affect cell fate, and then they tell axons where to go. It's kind of a nice system. And when this is all said and done, we will have a differentiated spinal cord that's going to contain little dorsal horn here, and of course an anterior horn. It'll be shaped a little bit differently. But we'll have our gray matter. This will probably shrink a little bit through a bunch of cell division. But we'll have gray matter surrounded by some white matter. Kind of nice. That'll be our spinal cord. And of course, this is going to be encased in that bony structure, the spine. So in the central canal of the spine, that's where we find our nervous tissue. Gray matter on the inside, white matter on the outside. The ventral root here. Jeez, oh, the ventral horn here, that contains our motor neurons. If you're in the thoracic, upper lumbar, or sacral 2 to 4, you'll have a lateral horn. Lateral horn has preganglionic autonomic neurons, and then the dorsal horn contains sensory uh, secondary afferents. Not the primary. The dorsal root ganglion contains the primary sensory neurons of the body. <clears throat> so we got our nervous tissue. Of course there's the meninges still, so we're surrounded by our pia, arachnoid, and our dura mater. No innervation. So we can get a lumbar puncture, we can get a spinal tap, and it, it, it won't hurt when you puncture the, the dura. And that dura will continue along, and it's going to line these roots. Uh, here we go. 
the dura is going to go along, follow the roots to provide a little bit of protection. And the ventral root here. And eventually these will come together and form spinal nerves. But we got dura, surrounds the spinal cord, and moves along with the peripheral nerves as well. We'll retouch on this in lecture seven. So the, the dura is going to form the tough outer epineurium, and then the arachnoid will help form the perineurium. Perineurium also acts as a diffusion barrier, just like the arachnoid, so it's kind of nice. And then, of course, we have blood vessels. you got to pay the bill. And the way that we pay the bill is, of course, with glucose that we pull out from the blood. So we have a number of spinal arteries and, of course, low resistance drainage here, just like in the brain. We don't have any impedance for draining out fluid. We don't want fluid to build up. So we have valveless veins. Great for, for very low resistance, but it also doesn't resist the migration of cancer cells. So the uh, epidural venous complex is a common site of metastasis as a result because of those valveless veins. Now as we continue development, this spinal cord is going to stay inside that, um, that, that spinal canal, but the spine itself, the bony structure, is going to continue to lengthen while the spinal cord remains the same length. So even though they match up early on in development, as the spine continues to grow, the spinal cord kind of raises up. So our spinal cord is going to end then and somewhere around the initial section of our lumbar spine, L1, L2, something like that. That creates the lumbar cistern, which we can then use for spinal taps. And it's also useful in, in anesthesia as well. Now, of course, it's not just a big old sack of fluid. There is some connective tissue, the phylum terminale, that's going to tether the spinal cord down there to the bottom of the spine. And we also have a number of nerve roots called the caudal equina, or the horse's tail. This is what's going to create the, the lower, so the lumbar and, and sacral and coccygeal roots that come out. It's from the cauda equina. Now the last thing we need to think about is the bone that's there. We haven't considered bone at all. We'll form the vertebrae by fusing together three structures which basically turn into two. So that, that notochord as we develop, this is going to form part of the musculoskeletal system because it's mesoderm. So this will turn into the centrum. The centrum of the spine. So that then becomes the vertebral body. So that big part sitting in front of the spinal cord. Now the, the um, vertebral arches, they come along the back here and create that kind of bony part you can feel on the back. That's derived from two neural arches. So there's two precursor structures here. Black's getting a little gray. These are going to grow outward and fuse together to eventually form the vertebral arch. And they do that except when they don't. And they don't in the case of spina bifida. So we're going to grow back, fuse and form a neural arch. We're also going to grow forward and fuse with the centrum. Well, sort of. We'll, we'll form some joints with the centrum. But now we'll have a complete vertebrae. And of course there will be many levels of these that create the whole spine. Now, there are different types of spina bifida as we're all well aware, so I'm going to breeze through these. If you need a refresher, go back to uh, MedPath 2. So in spina bifida occulta, you can't really tell what's going on because none of the nervous tissue is affected. It's purely just an issue with not fusing our neural arches. So you might have a patch of hairy skin 
on your lower back. Surprisingly high number of people affected by this, somewhere between maybe 10 uh, to 24 percent of people. Then we have the other three, and we're going to go from, uh, from best to worst. So with meningocele, the meninges protrude, but the spinal cord remains intact, so we haven't affected any nervous tissue, just the meninges, uh, but this can be a problem. Uh, you, know, you can have damage to the meninges, and that can, of course, affect uh, nervous tissue as a result. Might be more prone to infection, so this is something that needs to be addressed. There's a cyst that needs to be um, uh, repaired uh, surgically. Uh, Myelomeningocele is where both meninges and uh, spinal cord protrude, so we have herniation of both meningeal and nervous tissue. The worst would be myelocele. This is where we have a, a, a failure of primary neurulation. So those neural folds don't actually fuse. We don't go from a sheet to a tube. We stay as a sheet. And that exposes nervous tissue to air, causes the leakage of CSF, so this is a life-threatening condition. Must be repaired. Best case scenario uh, with myelocele is that you have lifelong neurological deficits. Worst case is, of course, death. Now, assuming that everything is going well and we have our neurons in the right place and all of our folds have folded, the last thing we need to do is actually form some synapses. And that's going to require axons migrating to their target. They're going to follow uh, both local and long distance cues to find their way there. And there's a number of cues floating around. Right? We got cues to instruct cells to be one type of cell, but that also can then tell axons where do you go. Are you a motor neuron? Well, you probably don't want to migrate toward the wind. You probably want to migrate elsewhere. Send your axon this way. There's a number of gradients going from top to bottom as well. If you're a sensory neuron, you probably, probably want to project your axon toward the head, not toward the tail. On the other hand, if you're an upper motor neuron, you want to project toward the tail. So axons need to figure out where they are, and they do that by diffusible factors. So there are guides scattered throughout our body that tell us where we are. Like the notochord, for example, that tell you which way is ventral. So here we can see an axon crawling toward a little bead that's coated with nerve growth factor. You can see here it's, it's a dynamic process. There's parts of the axon that are coming out and getting retracted. It's kind of looking in all directions, but it ultimately finds its way towards the bead. That's axon guidance. Now that really dynamic end of it, that's called the growth cone. And what makes it dynamic are the actin filaments within the growth cone. So we're going to see a little movie here where they're going to, they're going to supply, I believe, a little uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It, it's another neurotrophin. It can guide axons. And we're going to see how the cytoskeleton changes. Green is actin. That should be around the outside. And it's very dynamic. Tubulin in the middle, much more stable. Tubulin is shown in red. So let's have a look here. So in, in a moment, we're going to see... Little, little arrow show us. Okay, they've applied. Now look at how much green shows up. Now we start to create a lot of actin fibers. So these, these growth factors, one of the things that they do, one of the ways that they tell axons to grow in a certain direction is by stabilizing the formation of cytoskeletal filaments. So we can send out little extensions. And in this case, they're called philopodia. So they're little, little fingers made of actin. They go in the direction that they can. They can go in a direction if the actin filaments are stable. And so things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor stabilize actin filaments, and they can pull axons in one way, as long as you have a track B receptor, as long as you have the receptor for that growth factor. So some axons are going to listen to one uh, gradient, but not another. So sensory neurons up here, motor neurons up here, They'll listen to slightly different gradients. They might listen to some gradients that are the same, but there's a number of these kind of long-range gradients that kind of give very general directions to axons. Now, not only do you have to have stable cytoskeletal elements that we've just seen here again, it's turned nice and bright green, you also have to stick. Now, before I move on, I want you to notice, after the actin gets there, after the actin decides to move in a direction, then tubulin gets laid down stably. So it starts with actin, and it finishes with tubulin. So actin is very dynamic. It sends out philopodia to look 
to see which direction appears the best, so we find a path with actin, and then we build the road with tubulin. Now, whether or not we can go down a path, of course, depends on whether or not we can stick to that path. Not only do we have receptors for those diffusible gradients that are created, we also have receptors that stick to different parts of the body, but not others. So surface proteins must be able to attach then to the extracellular matrix in order for the axon to crawl in that direction. Of course, actin is going to be uh, pulled on by myosin, that's the motor protein here, so let's see what happens if the, 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 that top filopodium doesn't have anything it can stick to. So we, the growth cone is sent out of filopodium, yes. can't stick, so when myosin pulls on actin, that filopodium gets withdrawn. We don't move in that direction. But what if we send out a filopodium and it can stick? Well now whenever we pull on actin, rather than retracting the filopodium there, we actually start to pull the axon in that direction. So we found our path. Then we build that road by laying down microtubules. Eventually, we encounter our target. So, again, it's just surface proteins. Cell adhesion molecules on the axon bind to cell adhesion molecules on the target. So if we're in the central nervous system, for the most part, it's axon contacting dendrite. And when that occurs, we form synapses very rapidly. It only takes about an hour or so. One or two hours, we'll allow ourselves a functional synapse. And that's because neurons do their prep work. They do the reading before they come to class. They put together all their vesicles before they form synapses. They package together all their receptors before they form the synapses. So we have pre-packaged units. One name I wanted to bring up, just because it's fun, not that I expect you to know it, but piccolo bassoon transport vesicles. Piccolo and bassoon are a couple of active zone proteins. More on those in lecture 5, not piccolo and bassoon, uh, but the active zone. The active zone is where we release neurotransmitter. That requires, of course, proteins, because proteins do everything for us. So let's say we have ourselves a developing axon here. Of course, it has cell adhesion molecules that are touching, seeing, is this a dendrite, have I found my target yet? And let's say we have a little developing dendrite here that has the appropriate cell adhesion molecule. So when they contact one another, that signals to the pre- and postsynaptic sites that we found ourselves a synapse. When that occurs, we bring in these pre-packaged, these pre-assembled units. So we'll have big old bundles of synaptic vesicles that are all kind of tethered together like a float in a parade or something like that those get brought on down so we've now given ourselves some synaptic vesicles that's important because these things hold neurotransmitters and if you don't have neurotransmitters you're not much of a synapse so we bring in our neurotransmitters sweet then we need to bring in all the proteins that do stuff that's our piccolo uh, bassoon transport vesicles. So all of the proteins that are going to actually bring in calcium, for example, and, and, and help um, the vesicles that we've just recruited fuse with the membrane and spit out protein, well, we've got a big bundle of those that we can just insert into the membrane. And when we do that, now we have a functional synapse might make a whole lot more sense if these were a different color. So when that vesicle fuses with the membrane, now all of a sudden we have an active presynaptic site. We got our calcium channels, we got our snare proteins. You'll hear more about these in lecture five. The same thing is true in the postsynaptic side. Scattered throughout the dendrite, we have vesicles of neurotransmitter receptors. And they don't know where to stick until the axon arrives. But once it does, then it's just a matter of targeting those vesicles to the membrane so they can fuse. And after they fuse, well, look at that. Now we've got neurotransmitter receptors. So we take these big bundles, these preassembled units, and just stick them in the membrane wherever we have contact between axon and dendrite. 
and then, in two hours or less, or your money back, we formed ourselves a functional synapse. How nice is that? Now the same logic holds true in the periphery too. Peripheral synapses do their homework too. They read before they come to class, and they pre-pattern the muscle with uh, neurotransmitter receptors. In this case, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So the synapse that we form in the, in, in the periphery on muscle is called a neuromuscular junction. These things are huge, they're strong, really nifty. And they're also not made from nothing. These are made from pre-assembled units, just like in the central nervous system. So we can see a few examples here. So each muscle fiber has a neuromuscular junction on it to stimulate an action potential in the muscle fiber and cause contraction. And that's how our muscles change their length. Before the axon arrives, that muscle already has little clusters of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors just waiting. So let's say we got a few muscle fibers here. Now we don't know where that axon's going to land. So, you know, we make a few clusters in the general region it's likely to encounter. And then, when our axons arrive, wherever it is that they happen to hit, those areas stay. Maybe here's another axon to get that one I didn't get. And then those little clusters that didn't get targeted, well, they'll eventually be lost. Use it or lose it, right? So if we haven't formed a synapse, get rid of it. And now we have ourselves nice neuromuscular junctions. And they form rapidly because we've done the prep work. <clears throat> now where we migrate to, of course, depends on what do we have the receptor for. What kinds of signaling molecules do we listen to? What can we stick to? That depends on what genes we express. And what genes we express depends on where we live. So not surprisingly, neurons that live near one another usually have similar targets. And that's what creates the topographic mapping that we see all throughout the nervous system. For example, the visual system here. When you look at a goat, that's what's going on here. That goat gets inverted in your retina because of the lens. The neurons in the retina then project to the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus. Uh, we're calling it the tectum here because they're, they're in amphibians. But it gets flipped again. And the reason it gets flipped is because of how those neurons migrate their axons. But it is true that the neurons near one another in the retina will target neurons near one another in the thalamus. So let's say that's our retina, and this is our thalamus. So if you're ventral or dorsal, you're going to project to a different spot. So the reason that we flip is because those ventral neurons are going to target more dorsal regions of the thalamus. And those dorsal neurons in the retina, maybe we'll do a different color, are going to target more ventral regions in the thalamus. And that's because, as you're probably expecting, there's a gradient of signaling molecules in the thalamus to say, where are you? And so depending on which genes you express, that's of course based on where you live in the retina. Right, if you're more ventral, you'll project more dorsally. If you go a little more dorsally here, well, you'll project a little more ventrally. Right, and so what we're going to do is invert this image because of the projection pattern of the neurons. And the same thing is true whether you're nasal or temporal, so toward the middle or, or on the outside. Those are going to flip as well. All right, so the nasal uh, neurons are going to project the more posterior portions. 
that might be a bit of a mess. So, nasal, posterior, the more temporal neurons might have the more anterior region. So, we're creating a map. And that's just because neurons that live near one another are more similar genetically than neurons that live further apart. And so they have more similar projection patterns. So you see a map of the retina in the thalamus. And that map of the retina is carried forward when these neurons project to the cortex. Because these neurons that live near one another in the thalamus are more genetically similar than those that live far apart. So they'll tend to target similar regions. This is true whether we're talking about vision or somatosensation or motor function. The maps that exist in our nervous system are created because neurons that live near one another follow similar developmental pathways and have similar gene expression. So they listen to similar guidance cues. So here we can see the topographic maps in the spinal cord. So let's look on the bottom left. That's the anterolateral pathway, pain and temp. You'll see there as you're kind of moving from middle to a bit more laterally. So we got our neck, the arm, the trunk, legs. It's a map. That's how our body works too. Neck, upper limb, trunk, legs. Makes sense. Posterior columns up top. Same thing, neck, arms, trunk, legs. It's still a map and it makes sense with our body, how it's arranged. And it's also true in motor structures as well. So if we think about our anterior horn, kind of screwed that one up, but the anterior horn where our motor neurons live. Well, those in the middle innervate the trunk, and the, the limbs are innervated by more lateral motor neurons. In fact, they even have two tracts that hit them. There's, so there's the anterior cortical spinal tract that deals with the trunk, and there's the lateral cortical spinal tract that deals with the limbs. But there's a map. There's an orderly arrangement of neurons, and those that live near one another tend to target structures near one another. This map is true in the spinal cord. It's true in the thalamus, also the, the medulla, where we have another synapse forming. And it's true up in the cortex. So on the right, we can see our cortical maps for sensory on the left and motor on the right. Neurons that are near one another in the spinal cord target neurons that are near one another in the, in the thalamus, which target neurons that are near one another in the primary somatosensory cortex. Likewise, neurons that are near one another in the cortex, those upper motor neurons, will target neurons that are near one another in the spinal cord. Those neurons that are near one another in the spinal cord will target muscles that are near one another. And that's what creates our topographic maps. Hopefully that made good enough sense to you. If there's anything that's tricky, fill out the questions box so we can address it in class. I'll see you later.